Hello. Now that we've had a chance to look at Chapter 1, which covers the basic framework with, that we'll be using for the entire semester, let's go ahead and look a little bit more closely at how we can understand arguments. More specifically, what we're going to do in this chapter, Chapter 3, and in this video, is uh, take a look at ways we can analyze arguments. So we'll start with argument diagramming, which is a nice method that we can use to identify our premises and conclusions in arguments and determine their relationships to each other. In addition, we'll look at how we can complete incomplete arguments. Specifically, we'll look at what's known as an enthymeme, an incomplete argument that's missing either a premise, a conclusion, or both. And then we'll look at versions of enthymemes. Specifically, we'll look at one version uh, that occurs commonly. These are called rhetorical arguments. We'll look at rhetorical questions, the rhetorical question in conditional form, and the rhetorical question in disjunctive form. Then lastly, we'll take a look at how you can understand the parts of a conditional claim in terms of sufficient and necessary conditions. This close look at argument analysis methods will allow you to develop a more robust understanding of what's involved in understanding an argument's premises, conclusion, and the relationships between them and among them. Let's take a look. Okay, so we're covering all four sections of Chapter 3, and uh, my goal here is for you to gain an understanding of how you can analyze arguments, both in terms of breaking an argument down into its components and how those components relate to each other, and also how you can complete arguments that are not complete. Lastly, I hope that you will uh, understand a, an important set of concepts uh, for work that we'll be doing later on in the semester. And these concepts are uh, necessary conditions and sufficient conditions. And I'll explain in a little bit how Section D relates to the work that we're doing in Sections A, B, and C. So let's get started. Okay, first off, um, there are a number of ways that you can diagram an argument. Uh, but whatever uh, uh, system you use for diagramming an argument, the goal is to show how the premises, if there is more than one premise in an argument, relate to each other and how the premises relate to the conclusion. So a straightforward uh, argument diagramming method involves numbering in superscript your uh, statements and then using arrows and brackets to show the premise-conclusion relationship and the premise-premise relationship. In this example, we have just one premise, so we're using an arrow to show the relationship uh, between sentence one and sentence two, where sentence two is the conclusion. So we uh, use the arrow downward to show the inference, the movement, from sentence one to sentence two. So you have the argument, you don't take care of your dog, so you will not be able to accept the responsibility of owning a car. Sentence one offers inferential support for sentence two. Another way to put it is sentence two is inferred from sentence one. Another way that arguments work um, is reflected by the convergent diagram. When you have a series of premises that independently of each other support the conclusion, you can diagram them as you see here. You take sentence two and that independently of sentence three and sentence four support sentence one. That's why you have the arrows independently of each other going from a single premise to the conclusion. Note also that the numbering of the argument sentences occurs in order that they appear, in the order that they appear. 
So even though sentence one is the first sentence of the argument, it happens to be the conclusion. And this is rather common, as you've probably seen by now uh, in your work, identifying the premises and conclusion of an argument. When premises are intended to jointly support a conclusion, we can use a bracket or a set of braces to identify that joint relationship. So in this uh, argument, we have six statements, the sixth of which is the conclusion, and each of the five sentences that precede the conclusion are the premises. And the way that you read the argument should reveal the fact that the arguer intends these uh, premises to be taken jointly as support for the conclusion. Now having said that, you're going to find that there are plenty of times when it's not entirely clear to you if the premises jointly or independently um, serve to support a conclusion. But one thing you can do to help is look at the language that's used in the argument itself. In this case, for example, you've got a list, right? Premise one, premise two, premise three, premise four, and premise five are set off from each other by commas. And then finally, from premise four to premise five, we have the conjunction and. This indicates that we're given a list of things that go to support the conclusion and the conjunction pulls them together to serve as a conjoining of the premises to serve uh, as support for the conclusion. Another way in which arguments can appear um, is by is reflected, sorry, by way of the divergent diagram. Remember we said a while ago that every argument has only one conclusion, but it's not the case in our daily lives that people who uh, mount arguments do so in such a way that they explicitly identify arguments as being separate from each other. So here's a case in which the arguer has used one premise to support three separate conclusions. That's why you've got on the top the one premise and then you've got the arrows leading to three separate conclusions. So we've got effectively here three separate arguments. Lastly, we have the serial diagram. Here's another case in which there is more than one conclusion in the passage, but in this particular example and in examples where you end up diagramming using a serial uh, diagramming method, you have successive conclusions. Think about it this way. It's kind of like um, what happens when you uh, um, do a multiplication of numbers um, or you add or subtract numbers one after the other or long division something like that you have a chain of numbers the ones above serving as support for the ones below and then the ones below also serving to support further inferences so in this case take a look at the arrows leading to three and four and then five. Three is an inference from one and two together, and then three serves as support for four, which is yet another inference, and five is the final inference. It's the conclusion of the argument, the terminus of the argument. How do we know that we've got a serial diagram? Well, again, take a look at the language that's used in the argument. When you have phrases like, of course, that will lead to a drop in gross domestic sales, you, the phrase, of course, refers back to sentence three. And then the phrase, that will lead to, tells you that what's come before, namely sentence three, is going to yield sentence four. So one of the great ways uh, to uh, improve, to reinforce, 
your um, skill of identifying the parts of an argument is to diagram an argument. So take some time to practice with that. To help you get started, let's take a look at this example. Notice in the lower right hand corner, we've got three numbered sentences or three numbers to reflect uh, sentences. And the bracket tells us that one and two jointly support three or three is inferred from one and two together. Now let's take a look at the example itself and see how we can identify which is which in terms of premises and conclusion. Since cable news shows are politically biased and people appearing on these shows have extreme ideological views, we can conclude that cable news shows do not give us an honest account of events. Now, uh, don't forget, you can use your indicator words and phrases knowledge to help you identify the premises and the conclusion. The word since tells you that we've got at least one premise coming up and the word conclude or the phrase we can conclude alerts you to the conclusion of the argument. So we get this. Number one is a premise. Cable news shows are politically biased. Two is also a premise. People appearing on these shows have extreme ideolog ideological views. Why do we know that this is another premise and not an inference? Because of the conjunction and. Lastly, sentence three, we already know is the conclusion. Let's go back to the word and. And tells us that one and two together support three. Now let's take a look at enthymemes or incomplete arguments. An enthymeme is an argument with a missing premise, a missing conclusion, or both. One of the things that's really important to do as you are working with arguments is to make sure that the argument is as complete as possible. So whether you're constructing your own argument or you're looking at or listening to somebody else's argument, do everything you can to make that argument as complete as possible. You don't want any gaps, let's say missing premises or an implied but unstated conclusion. So here's a pretty straightforward example. I have a Cadillac, therefore I don't have to spend much on maintenance. What we need to do is connect the premise, having a Cadillac, with the conclusion, not spending a lot of money on maintenance. How do we connect those two together? We need another sentence that links Cadillacs and spending money on maintenance. Hence you get sentence two, which is in brackets and is uh, bold. Cadillacs require very little maintenance. The diagram shows us that we're given one and we're given three, but we're lacking two. Two is implied, but unstated. The complete argument is, I have a Cadillac. Cadillacs require very little maintenance. Therefore, I don't have to spend much money on maintenance. It's really important that you focus on the nuts and bolts of an argument rather than whether or not you agree with the argument's premises or conclusion. We're not in the business when we're diagramming an argument or when we're simply setting out to begin analyzing an argument in some other way to determine whether or not we like the argument or think it's a good one. Instead, what we're going to do is make sure that that argument is as robust as we think the arguer intends it to be. Let's go ahead now and try an incomplete argument completion process ourselves. So we have two sentences. This is a Woody Allen film. I don't like Woody Allen films. It seems like I have a point I want to make about Woody Allen films. Specifically, if this is a Woody Allen film, and it's also true that I don't like Woody Allen films, we can infer that I won't like this Woody Allen film. Think about that inferential flow that we talked about uh, a little while ago. 
when you have an argument, you've got a number of ideas and the mental fit, the mental feeling is that these ideas are leading you in a certain direction. So we've got two premises. It's a Woody Allen film. I don't like Woody Allen films, so I know I won't like this one. The way that we diagram this argument is in terms of the joint um, premises, one and two, giving us the implied conclusion three. Why are these premises joint premises? Well, suppose you just have premise one on its own. It's a Woody Allen film, therefore I know I won't like it. You know something's missing. The same with taking just sentence two by itself. I don't like Woody Allen films. The conclusion needs both in order to feel complete, needs both together. In our everyday lives, we see rhetorical language a fair amount. And this rhetorical language is often intended to convey an argument that's unstated. So when we're dealing with rhetorical arguments, we're dealing with another type of enthymeme, that is another type of incomplete argument. What we're going to do is look at implied, or sorry, implied arguments uh, by way of rhetorical questions, rhetorical conditionals, and rhetorical disjunctions. Again, bear in mind that the goal of this sort of analysis is to complete otherwise incomplete arguments. First, rhetorical questions. Very often, a statement and then an implied argument is disguised in the form of a question. So suppose somebody says, you haven't saved any money and you only have a part-time job. Not only that, at your age, car insurance is going to cost you at least $2,000 a year. Do you really think you can afford a car? That question, do you really think you can afford a car, is a rhetorical question. What you're really saying is, you can't afford a car. So take a look at the reconstruction and the diagram that goes with it. The first three sentences serve to support the fourth, which is reconstructed as not a question, but a statement. Remember, arguments consist of statements. Statements are sentences that are true or false. There are also questions that occur in if-then form. These are called rhetorical conditional questions. Take, for example, the question in blue. If you truly care about your children, then why are you neglecting them? Rhetorical conditionals are less straightforward than uh, non-conditional rhetorical questions, um, as you can see by way of the two reconstructions in red. Unless I know the person who I'm claiming is neglecting the children, I don't know whether or not the person doesn't care or cares and so should stop neglecting them. So when you reconstruct an argument, part of what you're doing is laying out the possibilities for that argument and then in so doing you're clarifying what the intended argument is. Basically what we're doing in this analysis is trying to not only identify parts of an argument but also trying to make sure that we understand what that argument is meant to be. In each of these cases in red, we have two different conclusions. So depending on how you reconstruct the argument, you're gonna get a different conclusion. Similarly, when we have a rhetorical disjunction, we've got an implied but unstated argument. So suppose you start out with the rhetorical conditional question. If you don't agree with our country's policies, then why don't you go live in another country? That reconstruction in terms of a disjunction becomes the following statement. Either you agree or you should leave. Then the argument reconstructed as complete 
becomes either you agree or you go live in another country. You don't agree, so you should live in another country. Now, granted, structurally, there's nothing wrong with this argument. It's actually a valid argument. The problem is that the first sentence is most likely false. And consequently, we have an argument that's sort of set up to make the person who's on the receiving end, if you will, of this argument's conclusion um, look bad or otherwise feel like they have to change their mind. Let's take a look at an example and work through it together. If you really care about the environment, then why are you not recycling those soda bottles? So we have a rhetorical conditional. The question that we want to answer is what the conclusion is. If you take the conclusion as you should recycle the bottles, then you get the following. I know you care about the environment, so you should be recycling those soda bottles. So here's how the argument would uh, look with respect to a completed non-rhetorical conditional. If you really care about the environment, then you should recycle those soda bottles. I know you care about the environment, so you should recycle those, recycle those soda bottles. On the other hand, what if you want to uh, convince the person that they don't really care about the environment? You say, if you really care about the environment, then you should recycle those soda bottles, but you're not recycling those bottles, so you don't care about the environment. Notice that depending on which way you construct the conditional claim, you're going to get a different conclusion. So let's pause here and take a look more closely at conditional claims and what the antecedent, the if part of the conditional claim, and the consequent, the then part of the conditional claim, commit you to when you're reasoning about a topic using conditionals. So first off, uh, I mentioned that the if part of a conditional claim is called the antecedent. And the antecedent is also known as the sufficient condition. So if X, then Y, where X is said to be the sufficient condition. Y, the then part of a conditional claim, is the necessary condition. So what is a sufficient condition? A sufficient condition is a condition that when it obtains, it guarantees another event. For example, a sufficient condition for satisfying your critical thinking GE requirement is to take philosophy six. Or a sufficient condition for having food in your stomach is eating a potato chip. A necessary condition, on the other hand, is what is essential. It's the condition that is required for something else to be realized. So you would say, for example, in order to graduate, it is necessary or you must or it is required for you to complete a certain number of units and be in good standing with the college. A necessary condition for fire is ox oxygen. So how does this uh, work in terms of a conditional claim? Well, you could say, if I eat a potato chip, then I must have food in my stomach. If I take philosophy six, then I must have met the requirement for a GE critical thinking class. I think you get the idea. So if we go back a step, right, depending on how you interpret the if part and the then part of your sentence in blue here, you're going to come up with a different conclusion. When you affirm really caring about the environment, you get the conclusion you should be recycling those bo soda bottles. On the other hand, if you deny the necessary condition, namely you don't recycle, then 
you end up denying the antecedent, which is you don't really care about the environment. Now, I recognize that you might feel like you're playing a little bit of mental twister, but the idea here is get you to begin to pay attention to the structure of the conditional claim because this is going to serve an important, uh, uh, or sorry, play an important role in work we're doing a bit later on in the semester. And also taking the time to conduct this analysis gives us a taste of what it means to analyze an argument. We're paying attention to the structure of our language. Okay, so let's take a look at this example. If Gary is playing uh, with Ticket, sorry, if Gary is playing with Ticket to Brazil today, then he is performing at the Lake Harriet band shell. The if part of the sentence, Gary is playing with Ticket to Brazil today, is the antecedent. That's the sufficient condition. What a conditional claim in, intends is this. When the antecedent is true, when the sufficient condition is, is uh, um, obtains, rather, then performing at Lake Harriet Banshell obtains. So the sufficient condition guarantees the consequent here in this sentence. Or it must be the case that Gary is performing at the Lake Harriet Banshell. The main goal of this chapter is to equip you with some tools for analyzing arguments. Diagramming is a great way for you to organize an argument so that you can see its structure clearly. Once you do that, if you see that something's missing, you can complete what's missing. In addition, this chapter involves analyzing incomplete arguments, specifically arguments that occur in daily life like the rhetorical statement, or sorry, the rhetorical question, the rhetorical conditional, and the rhetorical disjunction. Knowing how to complete an argument will help you to clarify what the argument's really about and then put you in a better position to evaluate it. Where are we headed next? Well, we're gonna spend some time in chapter four focusing on arguments gone bad. In other words, we're going to focus on experiential reasoning that fails, it just doesn't work well. And we'll talk about why it doesn't work well, how you can identify what's wrong with the argument, and how you can avoid reasoning poorly yourself.